everybody, and welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It is Thursday, August 13th, 2020, 9.30 a.m. Central in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Well, it's been a couple of days since uh, tornadoes, so I got around a little bit and needed to do some shopping yesterday, so I drove around a bit. Swung by the outside of the game store to make sure that building was still there, which it is. Checked out some of the other buildings down that way, because that's where it touched down. Pretty tore up over there. Sorry, I had to get a little water there the um yeah the neighborhood over that way is pretty nasty i saw a lot of down trees and power lines and all the rest of what you expect to see I'm not sure why I'm not seeing the stream i know it's there good morning to you also, there we go. Now it's working. It seems to be working. Let's see how this looks. All right. Game running tips day on Thursday, you know. Dweller 8, Neutral Good Books. Thanks for coming out. We're going to be talking about combat and actions. As you know, we've been going through the DMG, reviewing some sections of it with an eye toward how we might, I guess, better organize portions of it. Because in a way, the show is divvied up in the way that <clears throat> some things would be organized better, in my opinion. With world building on Tuesday campaign stuff on Wednesday and then Thursday game running tips is more hands on so if you look at it <clears throat> as uh, prep outside of games on your setting for world building and cartography on Tuesday and then you look at <clears throat> campaign Discussion on Wednesday as stuff you are putting together specifically for a uh, group of players, whether it's uh, prepping week to week based on what they are deciding to do, what avenues they're taking, or whether it's... Uh, Stuff you put together on the fly based, you know, stuff that comes out of improv that you're putting together. That's the sort of nuts and bolts campaign stuff. This um, Thursday stuff is a little more mechanical in nature. It's uh, sometimes it deals with rules. Sometimes it deals with player decisions and interactions, direct interactions with how to run the game and um, this section this next section of the DMG that we'll be reviewing feels like it fits under game running tips because it's so mechanical in that way well let's take a look at it we've got uh, oops, let me pop this over here where I can see it more readily there we go. As as has been, it's in the monsters and organization section on 104. Starts in the lower left column. As has been stressed herein, you will find that it is necessary to assume the various roles and persona of all creatures not represented by players. This can be particularly difficult in combat situations. You must be able to quickly determine what the monsters involved will do in any given situation and this can be particularly difficult 
in combat situations. And what he is particularly talking about there is, um, is in a sense, fair adjudication. We want to be working within the realm of the knowledge of that character or monster or villain that you're running without um, <clears throat> metagaming a bunch of stuff that that creature person would not know, that you as a DM know, uh, either about the players or the player characters and what sort of secrets and weapons they may have at their disposal, but also uh, without too much knowledge of the greater world, because uh, if they know, if they don't know, that two miles over there's a faction of what's it's coming this way, if this is not knowledge they have, but you run them as if they're hurried to get through this combat and get the heck out, uh, even if that winds up benefiting the players, it doesn't serve the campaign, it doesn't serve the game, and it doesn't actually serve the players because it uh, it cheats them out of some potential opportunities, and you don't want to do that. You want to give them every chance. Hey, Growl Knight, hosting me, huh? That's pretty nifty. Might be the first uh, first to host me somewhere else. The um, the thing is to be fair, and part of this, and I've read this a number of times. Obviously, part of this next uh, section here is going to be about potential lack of fairness. So let's dive in. Let's talk about that too. It is necessary that you make a rule to decide what course of action the monsters will follow before for the party states what they are going to do. This can be noted on the area key or jotted down on paper. Having such notes will save you from later arguments, as it is a simple matter to show the disgruntled paper players these orders when they express dissatisfaction with the results of such an encounter. The intelligence and wisdom of concerned monsters are principal determinants of their actions and or reactions considered also cunning and instinctive. Forgive me. I got a little something caught in my throat and I had to switch that off so that nobody would be privy to what I've just explained. Anyway, <laughs> consider also cunning and instinct. This is also important to remember that lawful indicates an organized and ordered approach, while chaotic means a tendency towards random individual action and disorganization. But these modifiers must also be judged in light of the monsters concerned, of course. There's a lot going on in this paragraph. First off, the idea that you're writing down your orders. So this is the late 70s when this is being written uh, over the course of a couple of years before it was released in 1979. And... One of the styles of wargaming back then was uh, simultaneous movement in which uh, both players would write down their actions for whatever their faction was on the, on the board, uh, whether this was a miniatures war game with uh, multiple players and everybody writing it down or just two players, even a number of hex and shit war games like uh, SBI's uh, Sniper and Patrol, for instance, would uh, have sheets where you would write down your orders. And then they would be revealed either by phase by phase or in total, and they would be compared often by an adjudicator, an official, a uh, referee of some kind in the case of war games. The, uh, 
the decision would then be made which orders uh, how how do they unfold uh, based on what each was um, do they both go off the way that they're expected to go off if you're marching in a straight line directly away from the enemy and they are walking in a straight line directly away from you in all likelihood both of those orders are going to work out swimmingly because there's no interaction there's nowhere where conflict would be introduced based on how those orders of both play out and so there you go um, so I think part of what he's saying about writing these things down before the players tell you what they're going to do is to be fair to uh, <clears throat> avoid any sort of uh, personal bias of having heard what the players suggest they're going to do and then reacting to that before the creature villain character that you're DMing um, would know what their actions are. However, the idea <clears throat> that he says you can then show it to them when they're disgruntled um, suggests two things. One, it suggests that you're so good that whatever you're going to do is going to thwart them regardless of whether it's a, you know, a knuckle-headed goblin or a, or a uh, intelligent wizard. And uh, it also suggests that your players aren't going to think of you as a fair arbiter, but rather an adversary. And unfortunately, in this case, I think that this approach reinforces the idea that you are an adversary. The fact that you're addressing it in a way that suggests you have to prove to them that you are not being adversarial, that you are not um, unfairly using knowledge that the creature monster villain would not have, um, in essence, in the moment that you're not reacting to their actions with what you say this creature monster villain would do, rather than simply deciding on a course of action and then simultaneously letting it play out as they tell you what they're doing. Well, you're not having them write stuff that down, right? And, uh, oh, you thought that was you when I when I cut out for a second? Yeah, sorry about that. Obviously, when there's something in your, uh, in your bit of dust in your throat, you're not, uh, <laughs> you can't beg pardon, right? I could have gone to the, I could have gone to the famous screen. I don't know if everybody's seen that at this point, but I do have a, a screen for just that sort of situation. But it actually takes a moment or two to manage to get it uh, up and running. So, as I like to say, that is the, uh, the guy has fallen off his ass who has also fallen on his ass is my technical difficulty screen. Green screen is coming through my face. Yeah, <clears throat> I know. I was playing with some adjustments with it yesterday, and I think I just made it worse. I don't know. Maybe if we just get some more natural lighting for today, it could uh, clear it up a little bit. Just washes me out, though. So I don't know. We'll just leave it at that. Somewhere in between, right? Anywho, let's... Uh, I think part of the problem is the light is not properly uh, set up yet to uh, really watch the screen with green. So we'll get there. In any event, this reinforcement of, uh, of the idea that there's an adversarial relationship between DM and players is not the way to go. you got to nip that in the bud, in my opinion. you got to flat out at any point that you are ever... Uh, what, that it's ever suggested that you are somehow playing unfairly because you know referees are supposed to be neutral if at any point it's suggested that you're playing unfairly um, you've just got to flat out say hey look if this was an adversarial relationship you'd have no chance 
I can just bring every monster in the in the world here to fight you one after another after another after another until your characters are dead. I have unlimited creatures at my disposal as a DM or and I can just roll more even if I've never suggested there were this many orcs on the planet. I can have more than that. So there's no there's no adversary relationship. If there was, we'd already be done. So there's no point suggesting that. What you do have to make clear, though, is that as a DM, as a GM, as a game master, as a referee, it is your job, and this is what I would have had in this paragraph, it is your job to make clear not only that you aren't adversarial because you'd win, but also that it's also your job to create conflict to present opportunities because without conflict and without opportunities for players to resolve conflicts there's no game and without a game as I always say there's no story because the story is the byproduct of gameplay and you can't have stories as a byproduct without conflict there's no, uh, you know, this isn't a Chilton's manual. <laughs> You're not just describing something that is factual and uh, immalleable. You are creating an opportunity for gameplay whence comes a story. So that's how it's got to go. And you've got to explain that early on. Otherwise, players get the wrong idea about the relationship between the referee and the players. And this is another one of those things, too, <clears throat> game running tips-wise, that needs to happen early with new players so that they understand. Just get it out of your head right now because you'll be making decisions based on the idea that I'm an adversary, that, you, that the referee is an adversary. And you don't want, you want them immersed in the world and thinking of the world as its own thing, divorced of the referee, the DM, the GM, the person running the game. So, so too, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're thought of as just another player who's doing all the busy work, you know, who's uh, running the game for everybody else this week. It's not just, uh, you know, you're not a pin setter. You're not, uh, you're not just helping them uh, get their excitement and thrills while not uh, gaining something out of the experience yourself. You're not truly a player. You are, however an important part of the game as a referee and uh, it needs to be understood that you are separate from the players if you were and this is part of the problem with the the whole idea of a DM PC instead of NPCs where the DM is playing a character much harder to much harder it's literally impossible to create a division between the referee and the players if you're running a player character alongside of the players because you're you're taking on two mantles you're acting as a referee but you're also acting as a player and it's impossible to do both at the same time so it really doesn't work so if you ever get uh, the idea in your head that uh, You've got two players, you want to run a game, while well, you're just going to play an extra character. Nah, give them extra NPCs to run, or let them each run two player characters. At least they're in the same mindset, even if they have two, and one's a major and one's a kind of an ancillary uh, NPC. So, thank you, Alexfire. Yeah, um... It's there's some important uh, important distinctions there that I think a lot of people think they can um, skirt when they're running games, and it's it's really 
there are reasons those divisions are there. Let's go on. Uh, wait a minute. Let's make sure I covered all of this stuff. Organization approach, well, chaos. And notice, too, and this is a bit of a review moment here for this. Notice, too, how he focuses on lawful and chaotic here. This is... Uh, this is a moment where Gary doesn't fully embrace the expanded alignment system here. He's still thinking in terms of going all the way back to the original chain mail where there was just law and chaos. And uh, it's true that law indicates organized and ordered approach, and chaos means tendency toward the random individual action and disorganizations when you're considering how cunning how uh, what the approach is of the various characters but so too you should be looking at good and evil you should be thinking in terms of um, sometimes uh, if you're running an evil character that evil character is going to do things that isn't in their best interest uh, just out of spite just out of uh, just to be rude. So, too, a good character, even if there's something that's very lawful to do, a lawful good character may lean toward the good side because they know that the law is going to hurt someone else so it doesn't cover both of the, uh, both of the parameters of their alignment. And these are things to consider when you're running these various characters. Examples of the responses of six different types of monsters follow the situation will be the same in each example the party whose composition and levels are unimportant for the example and would obviously vary in each situation anyway will be attacking the monsters in the examples in two situations situation one is where encounter occurs for the first time and while well, the party inflicts casualties upon the monsters Victory is denied. The party then leaves with its wounded, regroups, and returns one full week later to finish the job. Situation 2 is where the party, rested, healed, and ready for action, has now re-encountered the monsters in questions. In both situations, the response of the monsters concerned will be detailed. So you can use examples, the examples in handling actual play. Example 1. The party has entered a crypt under an old temple and attacked skeletons and zombies encountered there. Situation 1. The monsters will respond as the crypts are entered in turn. Being effectively mindless, they have no coordination in their attacks and no pursuit will occur when the party breaks off. Situation 2. There will be no change in response on the part of skeletons and zombies. Those destroyed will not have been replaced, assuming, of course, that some evil cleric is not nearby will not be replaced by reinforcements. Stores and furnitures previously damaged or destroyed will not have been repaired. Example 2. The party has located and attacked a colony of giant ants. Although giant ants have only animal intelligence, the colony is an organized society wherein individuals are part of a greater whole. Thus, response will be ordered. Warrior ants will meet the attackers and worker ants will remove the bodies, items dropped, and any rubble caused by the combat. If the queen is threatened, the workers will attack also. When the party breaks off the action, there is but slight chance of pursuit. Situation 2. In the interim, Bupa, reaching maturity, perhaps one to six warriors and three to twelve workers, will have replaced casualties incurred during the first encounter. Destroyed tunnels will have been repaired, new tunnels possibly dug, and general activity of the colony carried on normally. Warriors will again meet the party, although they may they may be reduced in number. When the queen is killed, all organized activity will cease. All right, example three. Well, you know what? This, with these orcs, is going to require a larger discussion. So, too, example four. So, I think we are going to save examples three and onward for a future next week. A future broadcast. 
There's going to be a lot to talk about. Example 3 may take up a full show. Because once we get into orcs, we've got to get into a lot more these days than you would have had a discussion of years ago, maybe even months ago. And uh, I won't get too much into it right at this moment. Sewn bindings can't beat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. First edition books did have good bindings for sure. No doubt about it. Have original DMG open from 79. Great bindings in the old days. Yep, yep. Yeah, those books, they held up. They held up a long time. Hey, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I've shown this before. I've given shown images of this before. Let's see. Hmm. Let's do this. There we go. Nah, it's going to be through it. Gary Gygax. So Gary, when he used to sign books, particularly DMGs, he used to sign it as if his autograph was an expulsion from the unicorn's buttocks. <laughs> it's a fart signature. Mark, where's my $10? Bucks even. So when I ran into Gary, I let him know that I had won this in a contest rather than bought this particular book. And I, he said, well, what do you want me to write? I said, why don't you write something like, uh, hey, where's my 10 bucks? So he did. He was a funny guy. He was a good guy. He knew I was a lifelong gamer, and he was pleased that I was doing so. Any extra questions in the... Uh, we got a couple of minutes. Picked up Pathfinder 2nd Edition books. Pages already fallen out. Ah, that sucks. They do a pretty good job with stuff, but you got to know that uh, so many of these things are being made at the... Uh, no, that one, I don't think that one is. I don't think that one is. I've, I've had a couple over the years... So that might actually not be the one that I won. So there you go. But um, no, that was a revised one, 79, but revised. So that's that's not original first, first, first. A few books that Gary, uh, signed by Gary Gygax, says Grell Knight. He was super cool after working with him on Legendary Adventures module conversion. I used to send books to him, and he'd autograph them and send them back. That's very cool. Thank you, Neutral Good Books. Yeah, hopefully, you know, these insights are useful. Uh, when you reread these sections and you've uh, been running a lot of games, you have different thoughts than you would have had when you first read them or when you read them halfway in between now and then. So there's always, there's always more. There's always more to add. If I were to reread that section... For a video a year from now then in all likelihood I would have some different insights to to add I don't know that I would change a whole lot um, I don't know if I would contradict myself but I certainly would have additional stuff to add just from games I've been running so so would you so would everybody um, you know it isn't isn't necessarily anything special But there you go. Aim Life 9. Oh, your link didn't work, did it, Game Life? Skip to 530. Yeah, I don't know. Never saw this guy before. Do we know Game Life? Is he new? Is he just here in time to get himself knocked out? Well, I'll tell you what, we're shutting down anyway, so I want to thank everybody. I do want to remind people of the schedule. Tomorrow we'll be working on adventurers, right? Building adventures, GM reviews on Saturday, rules retrospective on Sunday, weekly news and announcements on Monday. 
cartography and world building on Tuesday, campaign discussion again on Wednesday, and back around to GMing tips. I made some slight adjustments again to the naming of these things. I want to be sure I'm on the right side of all of this. And so, and I think game life has actually done anything. I think game life is just popping in to try to throw two messages. Sorry, buddy. It's a bozo no-no, as they say. So we're just going to block him. Anyway, once again, thank you to everybody who's following the channel. I appreciate it. Also, be sure to chime in on the chat stream when you're here. It gets you on the list for the weekly drawing of something free to give everybody. And if you're in YouTube, subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up, maybe a comment. Let us know what you think, and we would appreciate it. So, until the next time, let us say this. Thanks. Have a good one. I'll be back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow and every day. So, come join me when you have the time. Appreciate it. And bye-bye.